Patients at a hospital always deserve the highest level of care, and a primary aspect of that care is safe mobility and overall patient handling. During a hospital stay, patients will need to move constantly, sitting up in bed, getting to chairs or stretchers, or to the bathroom, or ambulating in the hallway, but every patient has individual needs to allow them to accomplish these things safely. It is our job as healthcare workers to ensure that all patients' mobility needs are assessed and the appropriate interventions are in place to allow them to attain the highest level of mobility in the safest way. We need to know what interventions and goals to promote to support our patients' improved or maintained mobility status. To achieve these things, at Trinity Health Livonia, we utilize the Bedside Mobility Assessment Tool, or BMAT, and the Timed Up and Go Test, or TUG. In this video, we will explain and demonstrate the use of these assessment tools and discuss what interventions and goals to implement based on the results. Every healthcare worker understands that each patient will have different levels of strength and require different amounts of assistance to accomplish various tasks. And most of us will have some way or other to decide what those specific needs are for our patients. The problem with this approach is the lack of consistency in the assessment, but also in the communication of these needs to the rest of the care team. One person may describe patients as a minimum or maximum assist, where someone else may differentiate patients as a one or two person assist, or by the assist of equipment they require, well he uses a walker. Where these strategies can be effective and safe for some, the lack of consistency leads to a significant risk for the patient. You may be told a patient can walk with a walker, and take that to mean that they are independent with a walker, but that patient may actually require some assistive support with their walker. This ambiguous communication can leave the patient without the help they need, and as a result, they may end up falling when they attempt to use their walker alone. The BMAT and TUG assessments exist to eliminate these risks by providing a consistent and reliable assessment with a specific nomenclature. We can ensure that our patients are being assessed properly and that the findings are being consistently communicated and understood by the entire treatment team. Not to be forgotten, Another very important aspect of safe patient mobility is the safety of you, the staff. Every time you lift, assist, or support a patient, you put your body and your health at risk. Assistive devices exist to take that risk off of you and keep you safe too. But still, we need a way to know which ones to use and when, and that's what makes the BMAT assessment so valuable. So who does the assessment? When do you do it? And how do you do it? Basically. Everyone that will mobilize a patient in any way should be able to complete the assessment so that they can fully understand their patient's needs and be able to maintain everyone's safety. So not only RNs, but PCTs and techs and therapists. Minimally, this will be completed by the RN on admission and at the beginning of every shift. But it must also be completed whenever there is a perceived change in the patient. This means when you think something has happened to cause the patient to be either less or more mobile, repeat the assessment. This can be done by the RN, the tech, or the therapist. Reassess and adjust the needs based on the results. Now we can look at how to complete the assessments. There is a useful decision tree available on the Trinity Livonia SharePoint page to guide you in the assessment of patients, and we'll utilize this as our visual reference here. Begin in the top left corner. Is the patient medically appropriate for mobility assessment? This is not intended to be as subjective as it may initially sound. To be inappropriate for mobility assessment, the patient has to be hemodynamically unstable, on a vent or BiPAP, or have an active bed rest order on the chart. But if that is the case for your patient, you would answer no, and the stop sign signifies you don't continue with any form of assessment. But that doesn't mean that you are done with the BMAT and TUG. The assessment is required every shift, and you will reassess the patient every shift or when there is any perceived change in the patient. And if during the reassessments, the patient at any point moves past these restrictions and you answer yes to this initial question, you will continue to the assessment portion. The next prompt is to ask, do you think the patient is independent? If you believe your patient can ambulate independently, even if they need an assistive device like a walker or cane, you can go directly to the tug test. If you do not think your patient can walk independently, proceed directly to the BMAT assessment. To perform a tug test, direct the patient to get into a seated position at the side of the bed or chair. To pass the tug test, they must stand from a seated position, walk independently 10 feet out, turn around, walk back, and sit back down. This should take 12 seconds or less. The barriers here are that we do not always have a consistent 10-foot measurement. An acceptable estimation of the distance is to have the patient seated at the bedside, stand up, walk to the bathroom, turn around, walk back to the bed and sit down. 
Before performing the tug test, apply the gait belt to the patient just in case you find out during the test that they do require some support while they are ambulating. Then have the patient stand from a seated position, walk 10 feet, turn around, walk back, and sit back down. You should walk beside them, ready to take the gait belt if the patient shows any signs of weakness. That way you can safely guide them back to the bed or chair. The patient should be able to do this in 12 seconds or less. That is a tight time frame to stand up, walk 20 feet, and sit back down. Just because a patient can stand, walk, and sit back down on their own does not mean that they pass the tug test. They really have to show some good strength, balance, and speed to accomplish this. The bar is set pretty high to be considered independent in a hospital setting. Many patients that people consider to be independent will not pass the tug test. That doesn't mean that they are unable to do things for themselves day to day, but when in the hospital, it does mean that we need to take some actions to ensure their safety while mobilizing and the BMAT will direct us to what actions are appropriate for this patient. If the patient is able to accomplish the tug test in 12 seconds or less, they pass and are considered fully independent in their mobility. But if they do not finish in 12 seconds, then you will proceed to complete the BMAT assessment. The BMAT is a functional capability screening tool which gives us an evidence-based assessment of what the patient's actually able to do with respect to mobility and function. It consists of four simple tasks for the patient to perform each requiring a higher level of mobility than the last. You will always start at the first and easiest step and progress through the assessment until the patient is unable to perform a task. At this point, there is no need to continue the assessment further. Failing at a certain step will dictate the mobility level and interventions required for this patient. Or they may pass all steps, which also dictates mobility level. At Trinity Livonia, there is a badge card that gives instructions for assessment on one side and interventions based on the results on the back. In this video, the badge card will be used as a guide to help you better utilize it in your practice. Step 1 is sit and shake. With this step, you are assessing basic core strength. Do they have the strength to maintain their balance when seated? The patient must be able to sit unassisted. You are allowed to assist the patient into a seated position, but they must be able to maintain that position without your aid. If they demonstrate the ability to sit and support themselves, ask them to shake your hand and make sure that they have to reach across their body to shake your hands. By reaching across midline, they are forced to twist their body and core, and in doing so, further test their seated balance. Have them shake with both hands, crossing midline with each arm in doing so. Are they unable to maintain the seated position independently? Or do they lean one way or the other while attempting to reach across the body? If they have the required strength, they shouldn't have these issues. They should be able to sit steadily and accomplish this. So if you observe either of these issues, they fail step one. Keep in mind, we are not assessing arm strength. If the patient has an arm in a sling, or for some other reason they are unable to reach across and shake your hands, you just need to have them twist their body from their core to test their strength and balance. Handshaking just happens to be an easy way to accomplish this. If the patient fails step one, they are designated a mobility level one. A level one requires the maximum assistance in mobility tasks. To transfer a level 1 patient would require a mechanical lift, sling, or lateral transfer device. At level 1, patients also require some specific level 1 mobility interventions in their care. They should participate in passive or active range of motion exercises three times a day. They require Q2 hour turns. As a primary goal for the patient, they should be in a seated position for at least 20 minutes three times a day. Ideally, at least one of those seated periods is while in the chair, and the assessment indicates that a mechanical lift is the safest way to transfer a patient to a chair. At Trinity Livonia, we have two types of mechanical lifts available. In some rooms, ceiling-mounted patient lifts are installed for use. But when a room is not equipped with this, the Maxi Move is a mobile patient lift that can be brought to the patient's room to provide a safe transfer using a sling. Use of this device is explained in a separate video. If they do pass step one, then you will proceed to step two of the BMAT assessment, which is stretch and point. We are checking for knee and ankle strength and flexibility that is a precursor to weight bearing that would support standing. To complete this step, with the patient still in a seated position, have them straighten their leg by bending at the knee. With the leg extended, have them flex their ankle to point the toe outward. It is okay to prompt the patient with various types of directions. We are assessing functional mobility, not cognitive level. Some patients will understand what to do with simple verbal cues, but others may not. If you reach out to shake someone's hand, most people will instinctually reach out as well. If you tap the back of the patient's calf or ask or show them how to extend their leg and point their toe, they will be more likely to understand the ask. 
the added prompting and direction can help progress the assessment more smoothly. So have the patient stretch and point with both legs unless there is some restriction such as weight bearing on one leg or the other or amputation. If they complete this task with at least one leg, they pass step two. Now this may seem off. You may be thinking, well, how would you be able to walk with only one leg that can bear weight? But the BMAT isn't only about how to safely walk. Mobilization is movement in bed, transferring from beds to chairs, commodes, stretchers, and it's ambulation. A person with one weight-bearing leg will transfer much differently than a patient with no weight-bearing ability. If you do have a patient that cannot stretch and point either leg, they fail step two and are designated a mobility level two. The appropriate mobility equipment to use on a level two patient would be a mechanical lift and sling, safe handling sheet, a sit to stand device, and a gait belt. The equipment list at level two seems to have a wide range. It's telling you what may be appropriate for the patient based on this mobility level. Always consider what is safest for the patient and for you in transferring a patient. What's the destination? Moving them to the bed, transferring them from the bed to a chair, from the bed to a stretcher or to some other surface. Depending on the destination and the patient's ability, you will decide what is most appropriate and safe within these level two options. Level two mobility patients will require level two mobility interventions. That would include the interventions previously mentioned in level one, but in addition, the patient should sit at the edge of the bed with feet on the floor three times per day. This is different than sitting up in a chair or sitting up in bed because it requires the patient to maintain their strength and balance in this position. The primary goal you are trying to achieve in level two is to get the patient to be able to sit upright and move their legs against gravity so that they can get closer to performing the stretch and point action. If they pass step two, you will progress to step three, stand. The patient needs to be able to stand from a seated position or at least lift their buttocks off the bed or chair for five seconds. It is okay to allow the patient to use an assistive device like a walker or for them to use the side rails or armrests to support themselves as they stand. But they must do this task on their own power, not with your assistance. We're moving up from the ankles and knees and assessing for strength in the patient's legs that would support their standing and balance. If they cannot at least lift their buttocks off the bed for the five count, they fail step three and are designated a mobility level three patient. At level three, the equipment appropriate for use in transferring a patient would be a sit to stand device or ambulation devices and gait belts. And again, consider the type of transfer and destination. A transfer to a chair positioned at a 45 degree angle right next to the bed can likely safely be accomplished with a walker and gait belt. A transfer to a stretcher on the other side of the room would be more appropriate for a sit to stand device. The safe practices of performing these physical transfers and use of these transfer equipments are explained in separate videos. The level three mobility interventions include those from level one and level two, as well as active transfers to the chair three times a day. The primary goal of these level three interventions is to increase the patient's strength so they can achieve a standing position with minimal to moderate assistance. If they pass step three, you will progress to step four, march and step. With the patient still in a standing position, instruct them to march in place for five seconds. If they need to utilize a walker or other assistive device like a cane, that is acceptable. After marching in place for five seconds, have the patient step forward with one foot to shift their weight forward, then step back to a standing position. Then repeat with the opposite foot. You are watching for good stability and balance in your patient. Step four is a precursor to ambulation. You are assessing leg muscle control and balance needed to ambulate. If they cannot perform both of these tasks, they fail step four and are designated a mobility level four patient. At level four, appropriate transfer equipment could be a sit to stand device or ambulation devices such as walkers, canes, and a gait belt. Level four patients may be able to ambulate with a gait belt and some supportive assistance from a provider. Use of the gait belt and walker are explained in separate videos. Level four patients can ambulate, but are not independent. Level four mobility interventions include all of those previously mentioned in levels one through three and also include ambulation in the halls or at least marching in place with a gait belt and support from a provider three times per day with a goal of increasing the patient's strength and distance that they are able to ambulate. If the patient passes level four and you did not already perform a tug test, proceed to the tug test described at the beginning of this video. If they fail the tug test, they are still a mobility level four patient. If they pass the tug test, they are considered independent. With both mobility level four and tug independent patients, the goal is to walk in the hallway at least three times a day with a goal of increased distance. The literature tells us that patients need to walk at least 2,500 feet a day in a hospital in order to not lose function. 
For reference, that's just shy of half a mile, or about a thousand steps. Most ambulatory patients probably do not achieve this distance every day, but it must be encouraged. Get the patients up. For those requiring assistance, walk them regularly. They may not be able to reach this distance at first, but with regular ambulation and helping the patient reach longer distances, you can help them get closer to this goal. Without that help and support, the patient will start to lose their functionality and their mobility status will worsen. Keep in mind, as you complete your mobility assessments, it not only helps you identify strategies required for safe patient transfer and handling, but it helps identify the goals to improve the patient's mobility. Mobility status has a strong correlation with patient outcomes. By helping a patient improve their mobility, you help them improve a lot of aspects of their continued care and recovery. Once you've successfully completed your BMAT and TUG assessments, you're not done. Remember, reevaluation is crucial. Hopefully, we're helping patients advance to higher levels of mobility. If we see improvement or regression, we always need to be able to adjust our interventions accordingly to keep everyone safe and provide the best care possible to the patient. Reassessment is required at least once per shift and whenever there is a perceived change in the mobility status of a patient. We also still need to ensure good communication to the care team. A huge part of this is the standardization of the verbiage, which is already included in the assessment bundle. We identify patients as mobility level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, or tug independent. Mobility status should be a part of every patient handoff. We've also gone a step further and created door magnets to identify mobility status of all of our patients. On the door frame of every patient room is a BMAT magnet. Use a dry erase marker to note the date and time of the assessment and identify if the patient is level 1, 2, 3, 4, or tug independent. That way, everyone going into the room has the ability to quickly identify the mobility needs of this patient. Whether that's the RN, PCT, therapist, physician, they will all have that information instantly available. Where everyone will be able to perform the assessment and adjust the door magnets, only the nurse will have the access to document the assessments in EPIC. Wrench in the tabs for BMAT and TUG and document the results of the assessments whenever they are completed. The BMAT and TUG assessments should become a part of your daily assessment routine. Everyone likely already does some form of assessment of their patient's mobility needs. But integrating these evidence-based assessments into everyone's practice is a way to standardize that assessment and communication of the results across the hospital. It's not adding anything new. It's just structuring something everybody already did to improve the safety and quality of our care. By using these assessment tools, you are able to dramatically improve the care and outcomes of your patients. And not to be understated, you are able to keep yourself safe and protect yourself from future injuries too.